You know, one of the things I love about being in a community like this is you get to meet so many different people. Uh, you get to meet people with a lot of different interests and like hobbies and areas of study and jobs and all this different type of stuff. And uh, one person who I love that's a part of our community is our very own Cole Royster, who's up, just up here leading worship. Isn't Cole awesome? He's uh, Some of you aren't so, you know. Yeah, there you go. There you go. We're getting, we got some fans, Cole. We got some fans. Uh, but Cole is amazing. I don't know if you know this about Cole, but Cole is actually like this physical fitness nut. Like Cole goes to the gym all the time. Cole has some muscles. Like he, a couple years ago, he was this peewee shrimp. Now he's just a, he's a muscle bound, you know, dude that's just kind of hanging out. And uh, I tell Cole all the time, I'm like, man, dude, I would love, like, I, I want to have muscles like you, man. Like I want to, there he is. Uh, I want to have muscles like you. Like I want to, I want to be like physically fit the way you are. And I'll, and I'll like tell him this every once in a while. And I even like at times in my life where I'm like, man, I really, that'd be really awesome. Can you imagine like, imagine like having an intentional shape of your body rather than just what you currently have, you know, and like being intentional about what, what it looks like. Um, I haven't experienced that yet. Hopefully one day that would be great. Um, but the reality is I may desire that, but the reality is I don't really. Because, you know what I'm saying? Because I don't actually want to do the things that I need to do in order to get the results that I'm trying to get. Because even if I wanted, and I, and I do, I still would say, like, I would love to, you know, get really physically fit and, like, Cole and get super muscle bound, you know, and have long, cool hair. But, like, I, the reality is I, I don't want to because when you think about what Cole has to do throughout a week. It's insane. I checked with him again today because I've heard about this many times. You know what Cole does to get ready to be in the shape? Cole gets to the gym at 5 a.m. six days a week for two hours each. I feel like you guys should be more impressed with that. That's, that's incredible. You know, you know what Cole does? Uh, you know, Cole, he actually counts every single calorie. Like every single one. Like there's not one that he's like, oh, that slipped in there. How'd that get in there? You know, he knows what's going on. He has like the science of like calories and food down to a T where he will tell you, oh, like we'll go to a place and he's like, oh, that's this many grams of this. And I'm like, I don't know what, you, are, you making, are you making me feel bad because I'm not counting it? You know, uh, he, he's like incredible. When Cole is cutting, he will, he will have 2,000 calories a day. Keep in mind that a Chipotle burrito, is between 700 to 1,200 calories for one Chipotle burrito. And he only gets $2,000 a day. That's insane. Um, you know, a lot of times when we go to, uh, like, after hours, when we go to Chick-fil-A or In-N-Out or Cane's or something like that, um, Cole will pop out this cold Tupperware full of egg yolks and bland chicken or, or, or cold rice. And I say I want to have the results, but really I don't because I'm not... Re- wanting to get ready to do that. You know, I still right now, I really want to enjoy Chick-fil-A tonight, like when we, when we go. But isn't that interesting? Desire alone won't get you to the destination that you want to be. It takes some effort. It takes some action. And many people will say that I want to have a good marriage one day. And they desire it, and they, they want to have a good marriage, and that it's in their head that no one plans to have a bad marriage, and they, they want to make sure that they are doing whatever they can to have a good marriage, but it's simply a desire. And a lot of times, we're not, as we look forward into our lives, most of the people statistically in this room will want to get married or will get married at some point in their life, and we all want the secret to a great marriage. We all want to figure out how it can last the long haul. We're going to figure out how we can thrive as a marriage and not just survive. And if you want this, which I hope you do, what you need to start doing now is you need to start figuring out what action you need to take in order for you to one day have a great marriage. So the question then becomes, like, okay, what is it? Like, what do, I, what do I have to do? What are the steps that I need to take to prepare myself for great relationships? What's the secret to a great marriage one day that I could actually, like, encounter and, and be a part of? And I'm going to tell you that, like, up front. There's a lot of times, like, we'll wait to, like, give you the answer to the very answer you guys are leaning in. I'm going to tell you guys right up front, okay? And listen, when I, what I'm about to tell you, some of you will be disappointed with. 
Some of you will think like, oh, this is a cop-out type answer. Uh, Some of you may even disagree with this answer. But as I get older and as I'm around more marriages and as I, have, as I see good marriages and bad marriages, uh, the people who in my life who I've like been close to and got to see like an up-close personal view of their marriage, uh, there's a bunch of different types of people, a bunch of different marriages. The one thing that unifies the best marriages of people that I've seen is this one thing. It's this one thing. And, and the thing that is, is the, the secret to a great marriage is this. It's devotion to Jesus. It's a, devo- it's a devotion to Jesus. Because when you become a person who your life's goal is to honor the Lord and for you to like act in a way that honors the Lord, it, it, it actually, the byproduct of you structuring your life of honoring the Lord and serving the Lord and putting everything up onto the table for the Lord to have complete control with, the byproduct of that is that you bless people around you. That you become, when you become more like Jesus, you become a conduit of Jesus' goodness to other people. And when you are more like Jesus and you desire to be closer to the Lord, you become more like him, you become a person who, like Jesus, blesses other people. And you become like Jesus, you are a reconciler. You become like Jesus when difficult things happen, you're going to make sure that you're going to just cover it with grace, cover it with love, cover it with mercy. There's this great illustration that I've seen before. This is called the marriage triangle. And I, I think this is great. You, you, have the, you have, you know, if you and your wife are, are we say, if, if you have Jesus in the center of your marriage, and you both are searching for Jesus, and you both are looking to Jesus, and you both are trying to do whatever you can to get up to Jesus, what happens is that as you go to Jesus, we find both of each other at the center. Because when you get closer to Jesus, and you have Jesus at the center, and both of you in the relationship are doing this, you actually have a lot more intimacy than before. You actually have a lot more connectedness before. When you both go up towards Jesus, and you structure and you put him as the ultimate person that you serve and you don't serve and you want to love each other and serve each other but not more than Jesus it actually goes better for your marriage than if you're just trying to serve each other because when you serve Jesus that means that j- she did something that bothered you he did something that offended you if it's just because of you guys like okay like there's not you know hopefully there's some motivation to kind of fix some things but if you follow Jesus and you have to be forgiving and you have to be grace-filled, then you have like a whole set of extra motivation to reconcile because I'm just trying to serve Jesus. I'm trying to make him a part of everything that I'm doing in my life. And when you do this, you actually get closer together as a couple. You get a marriage that is a little bit stronger than it would have been if you had not. So tonight, I just want to look at one passage in Ephesians and study what it means to create a sincere devotion to Jesus. And, you know, this is a relationship series, but like the dirty little secret of like relationship series, uh, at least in my mind, um, we can give you a lot of really good advice about like dating and stuff like that, and sometimes we will. Uh, But what I think the most important thing that you can do if you want to become a person who understands the secret to a great future marriage is for you to go all in with Jesus for you to figure out how you can like structure your life in a way that would honor him. Because when you do that, you bless other people. When you do that, you want to be around. People uh, want to be around you. And out of this passage, I I have just uh, six short takeaways that if you want to be someone who has a great marriage, you need to implement. So the first part of this passage is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. So if you have your Bibles, turn to uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 4. It's up on the screen here. And this is what the Apostle Paul is telling to this this church in in Ephesus. And this is what he he says to us as well. He says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. They have become callous and they have been given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity. 
But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self. All the stuff they just listed is what we were pre-Jesus. What, we, what he's saying right now is you got to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. So if you want to be sincerely devoted to Jesus, you need to make sure that you in your life have the evidence of a transformed life. You need to, if, if, you want to, if you want to make it for the long haul, like this, is just, this could like relate to a lot of different things. Tonight, we're looking how it impacts the marriage relationship. If you want sincere devotion to Jesus, it looks like an evidence of a transformed life. You see, every Christian at some point in their life, whether they grew up in church or not, they had to have a moment and, and a motivation to accept Jesus for themselves. Like, even if you grew up in church, like, it's not enough just to be like, oh, I, I just grew up in church. You have to have a moment, you have to have a reason why, where you decided that you accept Jesus and what he did for you, and you give everything over to him, and you relinquish all control of your life. You, like, turn from sin, and you trust Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you don't sin. It just means that you are, you are actively trying to serve him with everything in your life. Everyone should have that moment, if that means to be a Christian. You can't be grandfathered into Christianity. You have to do this. It's a personal decision. You got to do this. And maybe that happens to you at a church camp. Maybe that happens to you at church. Maybe you, a parent or a friend like sat down and talked with you about this. And the question, if you have been saved by Jesus, if you've had a moment, if you have a reason, like, the, like I want to I wanna go all in with Jesus, I want to accept Jesus' sacrifice for me, I want to serve him with everything, the, the question for you now is what the Apostle Paul is writing. Are you actively putting on your old self of your old life, or are you putting on your new self in your new life? Because we, even though we have the Spirit of God in us, we also still have our sin nature. That's why even though you became a Christian, some of you, you still struggle with some stuff. Like that's why when you, when you, when you gave everything over to God and it was like this great moment, uh, you still struggled with some things. That you still had some stuff that you're like, man, why am I so, that's, that's your sin nature. And you actually have the ability, even though you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, to put on your old self of your old life and produce things that this world produces. Or... You have the opportunity to take off the old self and to step in and put on the new self where you produce amazing things, a life that's transformed. So every single moment of every single day, you in this room right now, you have a moment and a, and a choice and a decision. Am I going to put on the old self or am I going to put on the new self? Am I going to go God's way in this area or am I going to go the world's way? Am I going to do what I want to do or am I going to do what God wants me to do? And if you want to be someone who's, who's fully devoted to Jesus, you need, just need to articulate the feelings every time you make a decision. You need to realize that decision-making in your life is not arbitrary. Like, there are certain things that will lead you to a path that is away from God. There are certain things that will lead you to a path that will, it's a greater joy and holiness and, and wholeness. And if we want to be people who are devoted, we've got to be people who take off the old self and to put on the new self. The evidence of a transformed life is someone who acts differently than this unbelieving world, who acts in a way that reflects this inward transformation that we have by being saved by God. And I, I'm, I just want to, my, my theory, my hypothesis for today is that in a marriage relationship, you want to be with someone who has evidenced change in their life. You want to be with someone who is different, who is, who is not the same as they used to be. You know, in a marriage relationship, there's something so like special 
when you see like growth in the person that you're married to. Like when you see like, man, this person, my, my spouse, they used to really struggle with this. Or they really used to get, like we really had a lot of conflict over here. But I am seeing this person putting on the new self and the way they respond is different. And the way they, they interact is different. And I, the, I'm just, I'm seeing them act in a different way. I'm seeing evidence of a transformed life. And when both of you in here have the, the, the evidence of a transformed life, there breeds some like intimacy with that. There breeds some like connectiveness with that. It breeds some trust with that. To know that, man, they're going to be committed to me because they have this new life on there. And they're serving the Lord. And they're not going to go the world's way. This is something that's desirable in a marriage relationship. Sincere devotion looks like a transformed life. Let's keep reading in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. It says this, Therefore, having put away falsehood. So therefore, because you have a transformed life, because you have a new, like a new self that you're putting on, because of all that, therefore, having put away falsehood, Let each of you speak in truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So the second point that I have, based out of this passage, is that if you want to be someone who is sincerely devoted to Jesus, you need to be a person that speaks truth. You need to be a person that speaks truth. And this is more than not lying. You know, like some of you are like, okay, I'm good. I don't like lie very often, so I'm like fine. You're like, no, no, no. This is actually like way more than that. This is making sure that you, you don't be a person who embellishes things. You need, to make, you need to make sure that you're a person who's not willingly taking things out of context. You need to be a person who doesn't exaggerate. Like if you are a sincere follower of Jesus and you actually agree with what the scripture says, you need to never look at somebody and say, you always... You should never look at someone and say, you never do this. Because we need to be people who are true. And in the heat of the moment, a lot of times we can say things that are not true. So we need to be someone who's, who's speaking truth at all times. And what many people in this world will do is they will want to make sure that they... they are okay with all these different groups of people, all these different places that they are. And so what they will do is they will like fracture themselves into a couple different pieces so that I can fit in with this group over here, so I can fit in with this person over here. And it doesn't seem like it's a big deal, but I'm, I just kind of like hide certain aspects about myself over here. I highlight a certain aspect of self over here. And what you do when you do this kind of thing is you fracture yourself. And instead of being whole and holy the way God wants us to be, we fracture and break and we show some people some things and show other people other things. And when we hear things like we got to be true, we got to speak truth, what you need to do if Jesus lives in you, then everywhere you go, it should reflect that. Do you have places in your life that you go where you downplay Jesus? Do you have areas that you walk towards that, that you make sure that people don't find out a certain thing about you? If you want to be someone who is a sincere, devoted follower of Jesus, you need to make sure that you are congruent in everything in your life. You don't need to have these secret, secret personalities, these secret things that you talk about to certain people. Like You need to be who you are. Be who God has called you to be. Don't fracture yourself. To be true is to be whole in every area of your life. And you know what's amazing? Is that when you, like, when you just accept the fact, that, okay, I'm going to serve Jesus. I'm going to try to be true with everything. And it may not work in this situation. These people might stop hanging out with me. This, these people might start talking about, back, like, kind of making fun of me because I was making fun of those people before. And I know what they're going to do. But listen, when you do that, you begin to experience like the fact that you're whole and that you don't have these different groups and you're not fractured in the way that you used to be. And and what's amazing when you think about your future marriage is that when you are with someone who you, who knows you, who there's, you're not fracturing and only showing this person a few things about you, 
There's not any secrets in your life that you're, that you're hiding from this person. When you are whole and you are holy and you show, and you're, you may not be perfect, but you're, you're striving to, to be a devoted follower of Jesus, but you are whole and you're real about stuff and you're real about your doubts and you're real about the stuff going on in your life. When you, when you give that to a, as a gift to your spouse, to your husband, to your wife, when they look at you and they see that, man, this is, this is who I am. I'm, I'm not trying to front. I'm not trying to like, tell you who I'm not. Like, this, is, this is who I am. There's something about being totally known and there's something about being totally loved. And if you want to have a marriage, if you want to know like the secret to a great marriage, you got to be somebody who speaks truth, wherever that may be in your life. And the opposite is true. If you are in a dating relationship and you're fractured and you, there's some things that you don't say, if you're in a marriage relationship that you're fractured and there's some things you don't say, when the person finds out about something, because it will come out. You're not as good as you think you are at like, keeping some of the things in your life. You know that? When they find that out, there, there breaks intimacy. There's, there breaks closeness. And God doesn't want that for you. So you've got to be with somebody who speaks the truth. Let's keep going. Um, number three. We see, uh, we see in... Um, oh, I lost my spot. Okay, here we go. Um, In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, it says this. It says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So if you want to be a sincere follower of Jesus, according to this passage, you need to release anger every single day. Release anger every single day. You know, anger can be a good or bad thing, like depending on the motivation. Like there's some, there's some things as righteous anger. You guys know this? Like we should have some anger about some like injustice in the world. Like what's happening right now in Israel with, with people, innocent lives being slaughtered. Like we should all look at that and have this righteous anger of this is not right. This is not good. When we see injustice happen in, in us, and like we, we should look at it and be like, this is not good. And this righteous anger should move us towards holiness, move us towards the Lord. But we can have you know, the opposite of, of this, where we have this anger that kind of motivates by like kind of selfishness, and we, just, and we go and we sin as a result of our anger. But what's interesting about this is that, that Paul is not specifying a type of anger. He's just saying, don't let the sun go down on your anger, meaning... That even good motivated anger and bad motivated anger, if not dealt with, can lead to some things that you don't want to be with, you don't want to be about. It can be dangerous because of what verse 27 says, and give no opportunity to the devil. The devil, the enemy, is always looking for a way in your life. Like, this is why we have to be careful about trying to, like, give everything over to God, to strive to go God's way. Because as soon as you, like, give a foothold for the, for the enemy to come into your life, it is going to try, he's going to try to steal, kill, and destroy. And what he's going to try to do is he's going to try to, like, d- divorce you from your community. He's going to try to do anything he can to hurt your relationships. He's going to try to, to get you to do anything that would separate you from God. And so what we need to realize is even the righteous anger that we have, even the anger that could be, could be good used for good, we need to make sure that we release it every day. It doesn't mean that we get leave people off the hook. It just means that we release it, that we, we make sure that we are not overcome by this. We need to be people who quickly deal with anger in our heart. We got to quickly deal with it. You've probably been around people who like, have unresolved anger in their heart. Are they fun to be around? Are you fun to be around when you have unresolved anger in your heart? You know, I, I remember um, our, my first daughter, Eleanor, when she was born, um, we just had a lot of complications uh, at the hospital with my wife. And um, I, I didn't know, it was like the first time I had like been in this situation. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what to do. And um, it was just like a really traumatic experience for my wife. And a couple months later, after uh, everything, you know, died down, um, Kyla, she came to me and she's and, and kind of out of the blue. And she's like, hey, I need to talk to you. And I'm like, oh no, what did I, like, you know, 
guys, like, do you ever get like a, that talk from your mom or your girlfriend or your wife and you're just like, oh my God, you're just like racking your brain. What did I do? Did I, and you just like make up stuff and you're like, I did it. I'm so sorry. Um, but Kyla, she's like, hey, I need to talk to you. And I'm like, okay, what, what's up? And she's like, hey, I just want to let you know that I have a lot of unresolved anger towards you because of how you acted in the hospital. Like, you weren't an advocate for me. You, you, you were just like, I, I just wish you were more supportive. I wish you were more involved. I w- and and I, I realized that it's like, I need to forgive you for this, but I have to tell you about this. And I remember being, it was like so out of the blue. I remember being like, oh my, like, I'm so sorry. I, I had no idea. I had zero idea that I had offended you like this. And here's the thing. When you have unresolved anger towards somebody, you could actually forget the offense but still be angry. Have you ever done that? Have you ever like been so mad at someone for so long that someone, like they, someone brings their name up and they're like, Bleh. and they're like, oh, what, what happened? And he goes, I don't totally remember, but I just know I don't like them, you know? This is what unresolved anger does in our life. It like separates us from people. Like it's, the, it's like the end that the enemy can use to make you sin, to bring bitterness in your heart. And when you think about a marriage relationship, what's incredible about marriage is that it's 24-7 open for conflict. Like you can, you can wake up into a fight, you know, at the middle of the night. Like there's, there's just always areas that you can, that it can just happen. And so if, if you want to be someone who, the secret to a great marriage, and you want to follow the Lord and like learn how to, to have a sincere devotion to the Lord, one of the areas that you need to get good at is releasing anger every single day. You release anger every single day. And here's the deal. Even if it doesn't, they don't like deserve for the anger to be released because you don't serve them. You serve God. And as you go closer to God, you say, hey, I just want to let you know, I'm, I'm really angry with you because of this. But I forgive you. I just had to tell you this. And I, I prom- I'm not going I'm, I'm to hold any grudges. I just have to tell you this because it's been on my heart and I'm irritated. And I'm, that's why I've been irritable with you. That's why I, all this stuff. You need to be somebody who releases anger every single day. And if you don't, watch out because the devil wants to get in there and he wants to hurt you. He wants to separate you from God and other people. And he wants to see death and destruction in your life. So many marriages are ruined because of unresolved anger. Maybe some of you, you've experienced divorce in your family. What could have happened if the people in your life who have been divorced, what if they just like came to each other in humility and said, listen, I'm angry with you. You did mess up. But I'm, I, I can't hold this because it's going to destroy me. What if we did that? What if you did that? You got to be someone who, who releases anger every single day. Paul goes on and he says, um, Ephesians 4, verse 28, it says, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. It's interesting. It seems like a left turn here that Paul is describing what a true, like, devoted Christian looks like. And he, and he says this, If you want to be a sincere, devoted follower of Jesus, you need to work hard and well so that you can be generous. Like, I read that, and I was just like, I, I might skip that. That seems weird, like, in the whole thing. Like, let the thief stop. Like, I don't know if we have a lot of thieves in this room. Uh, let's look, look, earn an honest living. Um, but I read in the scripture that you shouldn't, like, shy away from stuff just because you don't want to do it, so I went ahead and do it. Um, but if you want to be someone to devoted to Jesus, you got to work hard. you gotta, you got to be someone who works well so that you can take care of yourself and be generous to other people. And as I thought about it more, I kind of love the practicality that Paul has right here. Like he actually, uh, to, to be devoted is to work hard, do things the right way so that you can bless other people. So what this means actually is that the hard work that you are going to try to do to provide, to, to, to add to a family, it's not just for you. Think about that. We live in Orange County. Like, we live with, like, keeping up with the Joneses. We want to make sure that we always have what we need to have to look cool to the people we don't even like. And what Paul is saying that if you want to be devoted to Jesus, yeah, work hard, 
Or like, earn, like, be, like let's, let's try to get blessed by God. Let's, let's work really hard to do this. But it's not for just you. It's not just for you. Do this so that you can be a conduit of God's blessing to other people in life. And how amazing is this? If you are a person, like right now, if you figure this out and you begin to, per- like I'm going to work hard, even as a college student, even as like I'm just trying to get into my career, I'm just working a job, I don't even think I'm going to be doing in like six months. Even at, what if you, like right now, what if you're just like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work hard, I'm going to do it the right way, and I'm going to be a blessing to other people in a practical way. Like if you start doing this practice now, imagine that when you get married, how much more will you want to bless your wife? How much more will you want to bless your husband? How much more will the two of you together be able to bless other people? You know, one of the, one of the main um, factors that, that uh, people file for divorce for is, is money issues. And what if, what if we were people who just like, you know what? I'm going to work hard. We're going to try to make a lot of money because it's like we can't afford to live out in Orange County unless we do. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to work hard and but it's not going to be about us. Like, this is not where it stays. Like, yeah, we got to take care. We got to make sure we're saving. We got to make sure we're giving. We got to make sure we're doing all this stuff. But we need to make sure that we're blessing other people. And all of this stuff is reminding us that it's not about us. We're serving Jesus. And when we serve Jesus together, we get close. We get close. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. He says this. He says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Sincere devotion to Jesus looks like speaking life. It looks like speaking life. Foul or rotten talk should never be in the lips of a believer. And here's, here's the deal. Your goal in life is not to always make the funniest comment in the room. That's something my dad had, had taught me when I was in middle school because I was just always loving to throw the zingers out, trying to be the funniest person ever, you know? Um, and my dad told me, he's like, hey, just to let you know, it shouldn't be your goal to be the funniest person in the room because sometimes you're going to offend somebody. And people may not respect you for always trying to do this. And I was like, okay, whatever, Dad. You know, you're angsty, you know, teen back then. Um, But your goal as a Christ follower, even even if you are like super funny, even if you're really witty and you love to make these like cutting comments that kills in the room, um, if you follow Jesus, then that gets on the table for God to, to use. And so what you need to make sure that you do is that you are never somebody who kind of tears people down. You need to be someone who always speaks life over people. To never withhold the good things that you need to say to other people. As a follower of Jesus, your goal with your speech is to build people up. This means that you got to leave some jokes on the table. This means you got you to make sure that you're, you just stop saying certain things. And this means that even with people who like have really, that there are jerks and they really hurt you and stuff, this means that you, this is really crazy, you have to just not say very many things about them. You know? Like, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. Yeah, that's pretty good. Maybe you got to make sure to do this. And on the flip side, you know, you got to make sure that anytime you can, that you build people up. That you encourage somebody. You know, a lot of people think, well, I don't want to keep saying good things. I don't want him to get too big a head. Um, let him get too big a head. Like, that's not on you. That's not on you to, to, to manage his pride intake in his life. If there is something that is good that you need to celebrate about somebody, do not withhold that good. You need to be like, hey, you know what? I noticed that you did this, and I just want to, I appreciate that about you, man. Hey, I, man, you, you, you're so kind. I saw that you, when someone came in the room that didn't know anyone, you came over to her and you like made her feel welcome and wanted. I just want to let you know that like, you're, you're being like a conduit of God's goodness in your life. So thank you so much. It's not going unnoticed. You know, I heard this weekend that, uh, that people, um, they don't have like a cap on how much encouragement that they need in a day. 
Like no one gets so full of encouragement and it's like, oh my gosh, can someone discourage me for a second? I need to like get back down a little bit. Like you, you need to be somebody, if you follow Jesus and you want to be devoted to him, look for opportunities to speak life over people. And this is not just like an omission of like of handling hard things. Even when you have to handle hard things, even when you have to go to your brother, like Matthew 7, and like address the problem, what's going on, you know that a lot of people think like, oh, it's either all or nothing. Either it's all bad or it's all good. No. Even in the hard situations, you need to not speak death over them. You need to, even if they mess up and hurt you so bad, you need to be speaking life over them. Hey, you messed up in this thing, but I want to let you know that I forgive you, and there is a future in which we both can come out of here, but it's going to take some work. I'm not condemning you. We do have to deal with this thing. You, there is an ability to speak life. You know, my dad, he would... Uh, you know, I don't know if you guys uh, have uh, a dad who loves to, you know, make sure that you're on the right path. And my dad, he was, he's so amazing, so encouraging, but he always wanted to make sure to correct when he saw something going on. And the older I get, the harder it is to receive a correction from your dad. You know what I'm saying? Like as a high school, college student, you're just like, oh my gosh. And sometimes like the weight of like when you mess up and you fail him and it costs him and like you're like, Bruh. and he has to address it. And I remember sitting in my dad's office so many different times where and I've just like blown it. I've like cost him money. I've cost him like embarrassment. I've like done things that are wrong. And my dad, he'll tell me and he'll, he'll tell, he's like, hey, you really messed up on this. And this is the, re- the reality of what happened. And my dad would always break. And I would, I would always feel the pressure and the weight of what's going on. And this is what my dad always said. He would take a piece of paper and my dad would take a pen and he would put a dot on the paper. And he would say, hey, Rob, I know this feels really heavy for you right now. I know this really hurts. But can I just let you know that this infraction is like a dot on the page? That this is how much I love you. This is how much I'm for you. And I am not holding anything against you. What you did was wrong, but it is a dot on the page. And even when he was correcting, even when it was hard, he was still speaking life over me. And if you want to be in a marriage that lasts, that it thrives, that is good, then even when the conflict arises, you should never make these, you always statements, you, nev- you, you should never tear down even when you are correcting, even when you are going through it, you need to speak life. And when you do this, I love what it says in the, the last part of this verse. Um, when, you, when you do this, uh, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only as such as good for building up as fits the occasion. Don't make up good stuff about people. Make sure it fits the occasion because you don't want to like, you know, be genuine about it. That it may give grace to those who hear. Listen to this. The way that you talk to people could actually be evidence of the grace that is in you. You want to have a good apologetic of how you follow God. You want people to like come to know God. Maybe you don't feel like you're good at articulating a lot of things about, you know, defending the Christian faith, like the reliability of scripture, the fact that Jesus really was a person that he lived and he died, he, he rose back again. Maybe what you need to do is start speaking life over people and see how grace affects the people that hear it. So you got to speak life. My last point, we're going to read the last part of this verse. And it says this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. He closes out this, this portion and he says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. He says, put all that away, but this is what you need to do. Be kind to one another. Be tenderhearted. Forgiving one another. Why should you forgive one another? As God in Christ forgave you. So the last point that I have for you today, if you want to live a life of sincere devotion to Jesus, then you need to live a life that is in line with the Holy Spirit of God. You need to live life in line with the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian, 
like we talked about earlier, you have the ability, even though you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, and you're sealed, and that you're, you are completely justified that, you, that God has taken care of your sin, and you will have a home in heaven when you die, what you need to do is you need, even though that is true about you, you still have the ability to put on your own self. And what Paul's saying is like, if you've been sealed, please don't do what everyone else in the world is doing. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit that's inside of you. You know that when you sin and you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit inside of you is, is grieved. Because it shouldn't, it shouldn't be the case. So bitterness... Maybe bitterness shows up in your life as resentment and you resent some people around you or you resent your future spouse. What you need to figure out right now is like you need to like figure out how to get rid of all this stuff before you even get married. Like uh, wrath. You got to get rid of wrath. Get rid of this rage. Maybe if you have just this rage that come upon you when something doesn't go your way, You've got to get rid of it. You've got to ask the Lord to take, take care of it. Anger, maybe this internal hostility that you have towards people and yourself and whatever, you need to make sure to get rid of this. Uh, slander, speaking evil of other people, making comments. Like, you need to get rid of all slander. That should not be about a disciple of Jesus. And malice, which is just all evil. With all the things, you need to get rid of all that. And instead of all of that, you need to produce the Spirit. What does the Spirit do? What you need to do if you, if, as a Spirit, you need to be kind to one another. Like, we learn stuff like this in elementary school, but then we, like, forget about it, right? What this world needs so badly right now is kindness. Even if they don't deserve it. Let the Spirit of God give you kindness for them. You're not going to be able to produce it on your own. You need to be tender-hearted. You know what tender-hearted is? It's not be like sharp towards people. It's to be soft towards them. It's to go low to be with them. We live in a world right now where the biggest views on YouTube are this. People destroy this snowflake in a lecture. And we love it and we say, yeah, that guy sucks. Or that guy's awesome. But as Christ followers, we need to like reject this whole idea of like, oh, we're going to destroy people. Uh, we're going to own people. We're going to like humiliate people. We're going to be tenderhearted to people. We're going to be tenderhearted to the people around us. We're going to be tenderhearted. If you follow Jesus, you never destroy anybody. You got to be soft. You got to come low. And then lastly, and maybe most important, you got to forgive one another because Christ forgave you. You know, I, I remember uh, the moment I knew that I was, I could marry my wife, Kyla. I remember the moment. It was, I, it, it was, uh, it was in the aftermath of our first big fight as a dating couple. Like we were getting pretty serious. Like I didn't have any fights. And all of a sudden we just had this like big like knockout, drag out, blow out fight. And like, you know, it was, it was really, really hard. And I don't, at this point, I don't remember what it was about. Like I don't remember who was wrong. I don't remember who was right. Probably wasn't me. Um, but I just remember it was like a really big deal. And like it was like things were said and like it was really hurtful. And like we both kind of left. And like, you know, like that feeling you have when you like leave a fight like that. And you're just like, oh, and I remember the next day, she came back to me. And she's, you could tell there was like something different about like her demeanor than it was last night. And she actually, I could feel like the softness of her coming over to me. And she came to me, she's like, hey, I, I just want to let you know that I really feel convicted from the Holy Spirit. Like I really feel convicted. I should not have said this to you. Like, I should have not have done this. And I recognize that that hurt you. And I, I just want to let you know I'm sorry. That's not who I want to be. That's not how I want to, like, engage and interact with this. And as she was coming towards me in tenderheartedness and kindness and forgiveness, what did that do to me? It softened me. I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done this. 
I said, and I, I felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit as well. And we both, we, we like addressed the, the issue and we made it right because what we did was wrong. And what happened was we were not responding just to each other. We were responding to God. And it was really Kyla. Kyla was responding to God. She's like, she didn't say, I felt like you were right or I, I was wrong. She goes, I felt convicted by the Holy Spirit. And in the midst of this moment, I remember thinking, I can rock with this girl. Do people say that still? I don't know. No? Okay. Well, just forget it. Strike it from the record. I remember thinking, man, we can go through a lot of stuff, but if she responds the way she responded right here, we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. And maybe for you, you want to know the secret of a great marriage. You want to be able to make it through a lot of stuff? Be devoted to the Lord. Be devoted to the Lord. You never know what God would do in your life, in your relationships now, and your future relationships if you are devoted to the Lord. People will want to be around you if you're devoted to the Lord. You will actually reflect the goodness of God and blessing to other people if you are devoted to the Lord. It may make you like, so like you're not going to be able to be the way you used to be around other people, but that what you get in return is so much better. It's amazing. It's amazing. And when you move towards God in a relationship, you naturally move closer to the other person. And if you want to the secret of the great relationship, you got to be devoted to the Lord. Would you pray with me? God, what's amazing about you is that as we serve you and as we give our lives to you and as we pattern everything after you, God, it really does impact everything else. Like we just have, honestly, if we can just like do this one thing, so many other things will take care of themselves in life. And so Lord, I pray for every single person in this room. I pray for every single relationship that they have, that they would be able to be devoted to the Lord and see the goodness and blessing that comes from that spill upon other people. And God, I pray for every single person in here that they find a spouse that loves you, that is dedicated to you. May we not like be impatient and just choose someone who doesn't know you. God, wait, may, we, you, may, we, may you extend our patience rather than lowering our standards. God, would we worship you? Would we live our lives in, in dedication to you? God, would you bless every single person in here? Would you show up in their life in a big, real way? God, we love you. We thank you. You're amazing. And we worship you tonight. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.